our second lesson. Uh, in this lesson, I will try with you to build the first neural network, a small one. Um, we remember from the, just a recap from, from what we did in the first lesson for the logistic regression, we had our input x, this were the, uh, the uh, data sets, and in the data set, you remember, we had features, and we used for example, for the, uh, for the classification of a picture, we use the pixels as a feature, but for other objects, you can use other features. This is, uh, this is your interpretation. It becomes from the domain of application. So the features can be different. Uh, they are related. They're related to the application. Uh, we have our weights and the bias B. And uh, we had... Um, our function C equals W transferred X plus B. These are, of course, all vectors, yes. And, um, and then we used, we used the sigmoid function. We used the sigmoid function just for the activation to make a decision between 0 and 1. This is what we did. And uh, the output was a zero and a one, and based on that, um, we get the prediction. And then we were looking for the loss function of our prediction and the label. This means this is the difference, but based on the logistic, uh, we have the logistic uh, 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 equation, of course. And, and we are summing up about all examples. Then we have the, the cost function, and for the cost, based on the cost function, then we are we are calculating the differences dW and dB. These are these are our partial derivatives of the cost function dJ, dW, and uh, dJ, dB. And last not least, uh, after all these calculations, we are getting the new weights. And this is W minus alpha dW. And uh, the new B is B minus alpha dB. And based with uh, these new weights and the new bias, we are doing this the same. And then if you are doing, doing, doing it, uh, a lot of time and um, based on a really good training set you have a good trained logistic regression or in our case now we will see we will also get uh, a network yeah this is just uh, what we discussed now and the small difference now is that we have here you see we have our input and only one node. If we are working, if we are working with um, neural network, then at least we have uh, three layers. We have the input layer, we have the hidden layer, and we have the output layer. So, and um, the figure, that's, I mean the calculation figure, which we are using for the, uh, for the logistic, uh, logistic regression, now we are applying to every of these nodes. And you see, every, every, input, every input is connected to every node. And every, uh, every, every um, let's say, connection here has its this, this own weight. In that case, we had only three weights, plus weight coefficients, and plus the bias, this means four parameters. In that case, we are getting three by four, already 12 parameters for the first layer, and here we are getting plus four, because the bias is not included. The bias, you should always think this is special included. Here we are getting plus four, this means we should train, we should train already 16. What is very simple example, 16 parameters. This is, again, this is not a problem to train 16 parameters, uh, but it's just only to give you an understanding how the number of parameters is increasing. Yes. So, <coughs> and uh, for the training,
we have now to calculate to calculate not only one set. Yes, here we have only one set to calculate, and using this set to apply to this input to apply the sigmoid function. Now we have at least uh, three sets, uh, three times to apply this. Um, of course, we can use uh, we can do this using not any more a vector, but using some matrix. How this we will discuss later, and get an output. An output here. Uh, again, here in this case, we are writing uh, a sigmoid function, but we will discuss. Is this maybe necessary? Is it maybe necessary to replace the sigmoid function with another with another activation function? Why I will discuss this later. And then we are applying this output again here. At that point, we have a second a second um, set of weights plus the bias. We are getting a third output. This output we are applying for this output again, we are applying the sigmoid, sigmoid function and we are getting our prediction. This is our prediction. And then we are checking the prediction uh, against the label. And again, if this is fitting, we are happy. And if not, then we had to calculate all the differences. So we are going back. So we are calculating our DA, we are calculating our DZ, and last but least, we are calculating our dw and db, and uh, then we are applying the same formulas, and we change, we change the parameters, and running this again. This is then running in a loop. <coughs> so how to fix it? First of all, about the representation of a neural network. As I said already, the neural network, the neural network, we have this input layer, we have at least here one hidden layer, and we have an output layer. Um, if we have um, a binary classification, then we will have here only one neuron. If we have, uh, let's say, a classification uh, which is used, for example, for the unmanned uh, vehicle driving, then, of course, the class is much bigger. Of course, we should say this is a traffic sign. This is a NASA car. This is a bicyclist. This is uh, uh, some, some people who is walking. This is a tree. Don't drive to the tree. And this is the car in front of you. This is the car beside you. And this is the car behind you. So all these objects should be detected and of course also their locations. This means in that case we have already not only a binary classification, we have a multiple classification. And okay, the, 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 the algorithm is a little bit changing, but not really. Not really. The, the idea behind is always the same. Only the implementation is much more difficult. <clears throat> but um, if we have a binary, what, what, you can, what you can remember, if we have a binary classification that the activation function at the output is always a sigmoid function, because we have one or zero. But here, and these, uh, and these neurons or units, we will not use the sigmoid function, we will use another one. If we have a multiple classification, then we will not use we will not use a sigmoid function. We will use a softmax function. This you can learn later. But it's just only for for your for your understanding. Of course, it is not necessary that we are using only one neuron on the output. But it is simpler to start with simple figures. As you remember, for the calculation, 
this was the input multiplication with the with the with the weights plus bias, and this was the argument for the application of the activation function. And the activation function is deciding is this neuron firing or not. This is the reason why it's called activation function. Yeah? If it's zero, it's not firing. If it's one, then it's firing. <coughs> and Okay, I will not discuss now how, uh, how similar this is to the work of our brain, but at least uh, some similarity is there to the work of, of the neurons. And this is the reason why this was also called the activation function. So in the case of, in the case of a, of a uh, shallow network, we have, we have this figure now applied, we should apply this to every of these um, uh, neurons in the hidden layer. So this means we are calculating this for this weights, then uh, we are getting one output. And uh, you see, now we, what we need is not only um, um, a notification or let's say an identification uh, on which, on, um, on which uh, neuron we are working, we also should say on which layer we are working. Because this is layer, this is layer zero, this is layer one, and this will be layer two. We are always starting the indexication with, uh, with zero. And you understand if this will be a deeper network, then it's just we are getting additional layers. It's quite easy to, to add layers. Yeah, the same, the same is then working for, for, the other, for the other neurons. We have one in the middle here uh, again, and you see this is for the second, for the third, and so on and so on. <laughs> So if I put this together, if I put this together, you can see what is written here. These are vectors. But why to multiply this as a vector? I can put these vectors as rows uh, in, uh, or let's say I can put it as columns, as columns in some matrix, and then transpose this matrix. So we have two matrices. We have a matrix X. We have a matrix X where I have here my data sets. We said we have M data sets and I have my matrix W. And in the matrix W, I have here my weights. This is the matrix W for layer one. And here I have the, uh, the first weights, the second weights of this layer. And here I'm, um, ah, here I have, okay, for, let's say how much I will need. Uh, an X. No, sorry. This is one, but this is an X. So, and to multiply this, I'm just only uh, transpose it. And then I can multiply it. And then in one step, in one step at least, I calculate my sets for the first layer. Okay. Um, so, and I'm adding, uh, you can add the here some vector B also from the first layer. So this means, this means, this can be, this operation, this operation can be written at, at one line. 
Um, of course, from a mathematical point of view, you cannot really, because the output here is a, is a matrix, and here I have a vector, because matrix times matrix gives me a matrix. Uh, but adding a vector, this is not really possible. But from a mathematical point of view, I could enlarge the dimension multiplying with identity matrix. But uh, in Python, uh, this is quite easy because this is a broadcasting of the operation. Python understands that it should add this, uh, this number to, to every, of the, uh, every output. So this is quite easy to write. It's the same like in MATLAB. In MATLAB, you have also this uh, broadcasting of the operation. This, when we have this given input, when we have this given input, we calculated it, then we apply to this input our activation function. Yes, and this is now the activation function for just the whole for the for the um, for the uh, first layer. Then we have this it is output, and the output is the input on the second layer. Of course, you should make sure that the dimensions of your multiplications are always in the right shape. So this is from a practical implementation, from a practical implementation, one of the, let's say, uh, the tricky things where you should pay attention to that. Otherwise, your algorithms either will not work or you will have problems with the algorithm. So, and last but least, we are getting the output, but in that case, this will be a number, and this also will be a number, because we have only one prediction, only one prediction. But if you have a multiple uh, classification, then of course, we will get the vector of outputs. So, 
let's speak about the activation function because this is one of the important points for um, neural networks. Uh, there's a small <coughs> history behind. Uh, the first neural networks were introduced somewhere in the 60s. Uh, and um, they started to work with the neural network. Maybe somebody of you remembers the name Persetron. This was one of the first neural networks which were used. But they used as um, activation function a unit step function. Every engineer knows what is a unit step function and I hope also the people from computer science know this. No? Easy. This is this function. It makes sometimes also called heavy side function. Um, this function, uh, with this function, um, they tried to, uh, to make some <coughs> applications and then came Marvin Minsky and in one paper he showed that this, the applications of these perceptrons are very, very limited by uh, theoretical reasons, not because the people are too stupid, but, but because the theory behind and the neural networks were forgotten for 20 years. And um, only a group in uh, Vancouver from uh, George Hinton, uh, he was working still on that and he tried to improve it and he did a lot of effort and uh, they introduced also new activation functions and then they reached a really good success, what I told you in 2020. It was even that group, people from that group, who had the breakthrough and uh, based on that it was working. So, um, what, is the, what is the problem? The problem is uh, the following. Um, if, we have, if we have this function, this kind of function, as activation function, then this function has a big, the, the big problem is starting somewhere here and somewhere here. Of course, we have a saturation of the function. And this means even if the arguments are very, very different, the output is more or less the same. So, and you cannot have, not anymore you can have a distinction. And this means, this means, um, <coughs> we will see this later, I will show this later, then you are replacing, you are replacing the input not with, uh, uh, you are replacing the, the input not with um, a non-linear function, you are, you are replacing this with uh, identity function. And if you replace this with an identity function, your algorithm is not learning. And if it's not learning, uh, why to spend time? It's a waste of time. So what we are doing is now that we are looking for other activation functions. As I said, at the output, if we have a binary, if we have a binary network, at the output, of course, we will use the sigmoid functions. Of course, it's good for, for a distinction between one and zero. But here we need functions which are more sensitive. So, and one of the possibilities is, of course, the uh, tangent hyperbolicus function. Because the tangent hyperbolicus function, first of all, it's not so steep. And the second, you have at least an output between minus one and plus one. Yes. And um, the last, let's say, the, uh, what, what the, the group of Hinton, um, what they really introduced was the use of uh, this rectified linear unit function, which is zero at that area and uh, getting, let's say, it's a linear function at that area. But overall, it's a nonlinear function, but very easy to implement. Because it's just a maximum between zero and the input. If the input is negative, then zero is greater than a negative number, and so the output is zero. And if uh, the output, the input, the input is positive, a positive number, or zero, the maximum of zero, zero is zero and the maximum of zero and the positive number is the positive number. And by the way, 
what is the derivative of this function? What is the derivative of this function? This is, this is just, it is the unit step function. Yeah, it's, it's that function. Because the slope, the slope here is 1, and the slope here is 0. <coughs> so we are getting for this uh, Reno function, and we will need, we will need the, uh, uh, the derivative also of the, of the activation function in our calculations. We are getting for the Reno function as the derivative just the unit function. So this is really easy. The problem, the problem of this of this function is the negative part, because the negative part cancels out everything. So, and at that area you are learning here you are learning nothing. So you should be uh, uh, you should ensure during your calculations that the arguments for the activation functions are not getting negative. Otherwise, you have uh, too much units which are not learning. But a way out could be a so-called leaky relu, relu function, which you see here. The slope of this function in the negative part, the slope is less, but nevertheless, you have a small slope. So also, you are learning something in the negative part. Uh, how do you determine the slope on the left side of the rally? By experience. Okay. Um, I, I will show you, uh, for example, it could be 0 0.001, or minus, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, but plus, plus 0 0.001, yeah. It's a hyperparameter, you are defining it? Um, not, not, it's not really a hyperparameter, you just implement this as the used, as the used, uh, uh, Function. Uh, why don't we just use a linear function here? And this one? Yeah. Because you're not learning nothing. You're replacing the input with the output. And at that place, here, at that place, we have some activation. And if the input is like the output, if we would use this function, yes, the input is like the output. You're not learning as But in, in case of positive numbers, the input is... Um, yeah, but the, uh, the negatives are cancelled out. This is a linear function. This is a non-linear function. <coughs> so what we are doing is the following. We are replacing, we are replacing at that point where we had the, uh, the, the sigmoid function at that layer with another, with another uh, activation function. Of course, there are a lot of activation functions. Uh, first, I show you the table. Uh, it, is, it is not necessary now to read it. I only want to show you that this is not only two or three activation functions. There are a lot of activation functions. You can look to tables, and uh, it is not necessary. You find it in Wikipedia. Uh, the source for me was also Wikipedia because this you never never else you get such a nice such a nice overview because you have here also you have also here the the uh, properties of these activation functions for example monotonic the derivative is monotonic uh, which kind of continuity you have what is the range for that and so on and so on so but nevertheless. Of course, I can use, as you said, the activation function, that this is not really good for learning. Uh, we have the binary step function for the perceptron, or unit function. We have the logistic uh, regression, which we are normally using, which we are normally using uh, for classification. Tangent, uh, tangent hyperbolicus, and also arc tangent hyperbolicus, uh, arc tangent, um, both are used, both, but in the case of the arch tangent, you should have to be sure that your arguments are only between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. I see you are good students, not like my students. They would ask me why. They forgot already what is it? Uh, arch tangent. And here you see, here you see all as also other functions. It is, it is, 
may be also possible that that part is is not linear, but here it's also some. You see, uh, it has some uh, a special shape. But the good the good uh, use for that function is, and also for the Linke function, that the derivative is very easy to calculate and very easy to implement. And if we are thinking not only about the theory, but we are thinking also how can we make an algorithm which is working quite fast, then of course we should have also this in consideration. So, going back. But it that one looks linear even for... Which one? For negative numbers. Can you go back? Um, this one? No. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that one. Yeah, but I'm, think, I'm thinking about the range from minus infinity to plus infinity. And from minus infinity to plus infinity is not here. It, uh, it is just, uh, it is just uh, the parts are linear, yes. <coughs> this is the idea. This is a stepwise function. It's a stepwise function. Uh, the parts on, uh, are linear, so the derivatives are quite easy. But the function overall is non-linear. And I have not this problem which I sometimes have with the real functions. But then uh, there is a derivative like it's shifting. Like yeah, of course, the derivative is something like that. This is the derivative of a leaf tree. That's true. But this just only a not. The factor is not very big. What is the reason that you decided to have something linear instead of zero? Because there, there it was not learning anything? Uh, you, for well, well, for this or for this function? Yes. Which was? What means? Yeah, the, why, why did you this switch one. from that one to, to another one? Because it was not learning anything? Because sometimes if, if, you, have, if you have negative inputs, then it's not a really learning. If you have too much... Uh, here, in that case, you should make sure that you have not too much negative elements. In that case, you, you should not think about that. And in the case of this function, the problem is the saturation. The problem is the saturation. So this means, if I'm taking here an argument, and I'm taking as an argument one million, mm -hmm. the output is the same. If I'm taking, in that case, an input at one and one million, the output is very different. But this, it avoids, this function avoids the problem of an identity function. Because the identity function, I said, it's at least for classification, is not learning. Okay? And you also had to have in mind in uh, the logistic regression, in the logistic regression, we are using a logarithm. And the argument of a logarithm should be positive. Yes. Yeah, this we discussed already. So this means, this means, uh, we are replacing we are replacing the sigmoid function now with a different kind of um, a different kind of activation functions. The activation function on the first layer on the set or on the different layers should not be the same, but the activation function for all units in one layer should be the same. So if you are going to the first layer, you should define normally the ReLU function is used. But if you decide that the tangent hyperbolicus fits more, or you like it more, then you can use it, but please use it for all units in the first layer. Then you are going to the second layer, and in the second layer you can use another activation function for a deeper network. But again, uh, think about uh, which kind of activation function makes sense. And please have also in mind changing the activation function means to implement more input elements. <coughs> but if we replace, and this was your question, if we replace this with the, uh, um, uh, with the linear function, then we have here C1. We are getting this. Then the activation is C1. 
And this is going in here side. What we are learning, we learned nothing. Yes. Because in that case, uh, if we are using a disactivation function, what we are doing is we are just multiplying matrices. If you have a look, this is the input. We have as an output, we are getting the multiplication of these two matrices with that, and we have two different parts, but it's looking in the same way. Can I ask one yeah, the input. Can I ask one more question? Uh, you mentioned that it's not important to, be, uh, to, to have, uh, we can have binary like in, in that layer. Yeah, but it's important that we have, we learn something here. In the, first layer. Why? in the first layer, in the first layer, the idea is to replace the sigmoid with one of these functions. Yes, uh, this is not true. This should not not replace it with a linear function, but with a sigmoid function for a binary uh, classification and for a multiple classification with a softmax function, which is something like the the probability. Yeah, if you have. If you have, uh, let's say, 10 classes, you're calculating something like the probability for every class in the output, and then you say, okay, I'm taking the class with the highest probability. Uh, how this is implemented, uh, this is not really a, prob a probability, but very close. So this is about the uh, activation function. is about the derivatives. As you see, uh, we will need we will need uh, also the slope. We will need the slope of uh, our activation functions for the calculation for the calculation of the new uh, uh, of the new weights. So, uh, how to calculate? This is quite easy mathematical exercise. Um, If our g of z, uh, or sigma of z, sorry, sigma of z is 1 divided by 1 plus e power by minus z, then uh, uh, g sigma prime is then minus, uh, minus e power by minus z divided by 1 plus e power by minus z squared. Everybody agrees? Or should I show it? No. Then, then we can say this is the same. This is the same like uh, uh, 1 uh, minus e power, uh, sorry, e power by minus z and plus one, uh, minus 1. And this is uh, 1 minus uh, e power by minus z squared. And we split this, then we are getting here 1 divided by uh, 1 plus e power by minus z. And minus 1 divided by 1 e power by minus z squared. And uh, this is sigma of z minus sigma of z 
squared or sigma of z 1 minus sigma of z. And this fits always. So we always know what is the derivative and we can plug in. If I call this, if I call this a, then uh, the derivative is a times 1 minus a. So it is quite easy to use in an algorithm. So this we are using, uh, this we are using for the derivative of the sigmoid function. And the same way, in the same way, if uh, you have uh, tangent hyperbolicus of z, uh, this is um, our new g of z, the new activation function. Then g prime is the derivative, and this you can calculate. Uh, this is 1 minus tangent hyperbolicus squared z. Look in any formula. But you can try it also by yourself as uh, x power. Uh, my, uh, plus z minus x minus z by x plus z plus x minus z. Sine hyperbolicus by 2, and this is the cosine hyperbolicus also by 2. 2 is, uh, <coughs> uh, is called out, and uh, then we have this much. So this is also very easy to what, what, what that? Tension hyperbolicus. Yeah, this is the tension hyperbolicus function. It's a sine hyperbolicus divided by, by cosine hyperbolicus. And uh, yeah. If you uh, try a little bit you will get to the same point. I will not use my time now. You find that you find it in every book. So this means uh, if I call this a, if I call this a, then also this is one minus a squared. Very easy to find. Very easy to calculate. So you see, you see, as the activation functions, we are not only looking for nonlinear functions, and we are not only looking for uh, nonlinear functions which fulfill uh, the, uh, the requirement that they give a, sen a sensitive act uh, output. We are also looking for activation functions which are easy to calculate, where the derivatives are easy to calculate. Because we need this, we will need this in the, uh, sorry. Uh, we will need this in uh, the uh, uh, in the calculation of the uh, of the derivatives of our cost function. So, and the, the derivatives of the uh, relo and the uh, the leaky relo uh, we discussed already. Sorry, there is something missing. So. This is the unit step function in that case, and this is the unit step, but this side is a little bit higher. But normally we are taking here a value which is positive but very, very small. So this means the slope, the slope which we have here should be a very, very, uh, um, let's say, non-steep slope. slope. Now we are coming to the gradient. So, as the parameters, we have now the input of our uh, of our um, the number the number of units in the first and the uh, the uh, this is. This is the dimension of my the dimension of my 
a, a matrix for the weights and the first layer. This is the dimension for the bias vector. This is the dimension for the matrix on the second layer. And this is the dimension for the bias on the second layer. And if you have a look, this is always, this is the same. These are the same numbers, and these are the same numbers also. So you have to have this, but when you are checking uh, the, the shapes of your matrices, you can do this in such a way. Because for this matrix we will use the transpose, for this matrix we also will use the transpose. So then we are calculating our cost function based, uh, based on all these uh, matrices. And then we should, we should um, take, uh, get the gradient descent. And the gradient descent um, is calculated in the following, that uh, I am now um, checking what are the difference, what is the derivative of my cost function by the components of the first layer and by the first bias. And this I will use to improve these, these components, these parameters. And in the same way, in the same way, I'm checking this also for the components on the on the second layer. Yes, we are always calculating now the derivatives. So the implementation then uh, would be uh, the following: that from a formal point of view, I have my first output. Then I'm using the activation function on the first layer. On this, this output is now the input here. I'm getting an output here. This output is used as an input to the second layer. We are using we are using this uh, this weights and we are using this bias. And last but least, we have here an output. And please have in mind, in that case, we are using the sigmoid function. If you are implement this uh, now for the backward propagation, we are first checking the difference at the output. So this is our predict uh, our predicted values. These are the labels, and the difference between the predicted values and the uh, uh, and the, uh, this this the predicted value and the, the real labels gives us the differences in the second layer. We are using the differences in the second layer and multiply them with the with this formula, with this value. And we are getting the differences in the weights in the second layer. Because this was the input, as you see, this is the input, is the input to the first layer. And if you are taking the derivatives then just A is, uh, is left. So, <coughs> and last but least, last but least, um, the bias on the, uh, on the second layer is just the sum, is just the sum over my D sets, which I have here. Divided by the, uh, the axis is just only the question, this is uh, just a programming uh, question. In which, in which dimension I'm, I'm looking for a sum. Yeah. I'm going for the columns or I'm going, going for the rows. And uh, then, <coughs> again, in the same way, I'm now, not in, the, sorry, not in the same way, now in a special application, I'm calculating my D sets on the first layer of these D sets. And this is the multiplication of my weights from the second layer with, the diff with these kind of differences and multiplied with the derivative with the derivative of my activation function. And this is multiplied by element. This means this is not a matrix multiplication, this is just a ray uh, multiplication. So, and based on that, if I have this value, then I can calculate the differences uh, for the first for the first um, uh, parameters 
and also the differences for the bias. And if I have this, 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 then I can apply this and uh, change, change the parameters. W, my W is in the first layer, my, my bias in the first layer, my uh, parameters, or my matrix uh, W in the second layer, and also the bias in the second layer. So, and this computation figure, now we are doing 1,000 times, 10,000 times, it depends on you how long you will learn. Uh, uh, the, the question how often you will repeat this, uh, this is again a practical question. Check the learning curve which I gave you. This means uh, are you, have, you, have your differences or do you have a saturation of the learning curve? If you have a saturation of the learning curve, just break up. Then it makes no sense. How about unsupervised learning? This, so? is, this is in case of supervised learning. Yes, uh, this is totally different. This is totally different. Um, let's say, in the case of unsupervised learning, uh, what we are doing is, first of all, uh, we want, in the case of, we can apply different kinds of unsupervised learning, but let's, let, me, uh, let me speak about clustering. Uh, in the case of clustering, see, it means we have some data and we want to find out which data are similar. But the question, how much clusters I will set, this is your decision. This is not given from the data. Of course you can have a first look on the scatter plot and say, okay, it looks so like there are three clouds or four clouds or five clouds. And then you can decide uh, how you will how you will um, calculate or how you will calculate which which data are going to which cloud. For example, you can try to set to to work with the centers of gravitation or the mass centers. For every cloud, you you try to calculate the mass center. Then you then you are calculating the distances. And when the distance between two mass centers is different, then you choose the the minimum. And then you separate this. And based on that, you can try to give labels and then make a supervised learning. Um, but it is unsure if you, if you really have the right number of clouds. Uh, of, of, of clouds. Because this is just, a, 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 let's say, a practical question and the question, um, you know, problem. Uh, based on the problems, based on the practical, based on, on the praxis, and um, of course also on your experience. So that's possible. Because you can say you can say, okay, it looks like three clouds, right? like three clouds, but I know there is an error in measurement, and this error in measurement is responsible for the third cloud, for example. Sorry. So, for example, you can switch from unsupervised, just level. level. Do first, first you are doing an unsupervised learning, and based on this, you can try to make a supervised learning when it make, when it makes sense. Yeah, this is okay. If you like this to do uh, every day after in the afternoon after I don't know dinner, you have nothing else to do. Then of course you can do it for fun, but uh, normally because the implementation of this takes a lot of time. And the cleaning of the data, this is, I didn't speak about that, but cleaning of the data takes you most of the time. Then uh, I saw you will have a, a summer school in, in data science, and I think uh, the lecturers will spend a lot of time on the data cleaning, and uh, you will see how much effort you will need for that. Uh, then you can try to, uh, to apply this different kind of algorithms. And NASA. Another, um, let's say, application is um, um, a reducing of the dimension of um, uh, the dimension of your objects or of your data. Yeah. For example, if we are looking to the colors, to the colors of a, of a picture, then of course we cannot have only RGB with from zero to two hundred fifty-five and three channels. 
we can have also other values. And in that case, it makes sense to reduce. And based on this, uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the reduced picture, nevertheless, see if you can work with this. This is quite often done with a uh, principal component analysis, mm -hmm. where you're working with the uh, um, singular values of the matrix which you get from the pixels. Again, who knows a little bit area numerics, and unfortunately I'm coming from mass. So I know how much uh, computation effort you need to make a principal component analysis, because this is something like the calculation of singular value, uh, singular values of, uh, of matrices. And um, these are one of the most uh, computation consuming operations and calculations which you can do in mass at all. So it's always a question, makes a sense or not. But nevertheless, if you have the reducing, then you make your operations and then you go up again to the original dimension. This, but again, do you need it or not? This is, not, and this is what, this, it, it depends from the real application. Okay, but um, in the case of supervised learning with, um, uh, with deep networks, we will, we will need to calculate the derivatives and to improve this with the learning rate. So coming to the back propagation, which is the most challenging part. No. You see, the computer is so afraid about back propagation that you don't want to show it. I'm sorry for that. In the case of the uh, logistic regression, maybe uh, you remember this. Uh, this was um, we go for the for the backward propagation. We go this way, and last but not least, we want to know what we want to know what is the derivative of this of this value by w by the w's and by b. This is what we want to learn. Of course, we could do this in such a way that uh, we uh, calculate this in one step. But then you ha don't have a calculations, a, ca a computation scheme which you can apply in a computer, uh, in, in, in a program like a sub program. So for this reason, um, we are using we are using another application. First of all, we say, okay, we calculate, we calculate the derivative of our cost function, of our cost function by A. And this is quite easy, because this is a log function, and you're getting minus Y divided <coughs> by A, and minus times minus is plus, 1 minus A divided by 1 plus A. So, this we know already. 
And then we calculate, uh, we calculate uh, the cost function by set. And the cost function by set using um, a theorem from a mass of the chain rule of taking derivatives is dL by dA, dA by dZ. So dL by dA we already calculated. And this value, this value by Z, this is just the derivative which we saw and which we discussed of our activation function by Z. Of course, A is nothing else like our activation function. And we discussed, we saw that the activation function for um, the activation function for um, let's say the sigmoid function uh, has a special has a special uh, form. The activation function, or let's say the derivative of the activation function for the tangent hyperbolicus function, has a special form, and so on. So this is also predefined uh, from the activation function, and then it's quite easy to multiply this, but have in mind, we should multiply this element-wise. We should not <coughs> multiply this as vectors, and we should not multiply this as matrices. So, and um, based on that, based on that, now uh, we can uh, we can calculate dA. Of course, this is this value times the derivative. So we have the set. And on the, on the output, here, we have our dz on the other ways, and then we can multiply, we can calculate dw and dv. Of course, dv is the next sign like dz, and dw is like dz times x. So, having in mind, having in mind this computational scheme, which are, we are getting from the logistic regression, we can try to apply this again to um, the uh, To the neural network, because this was the computational chain. This is the computational chain for our neural network. So we are starting. We are starting again um, here, and we are calculating. We are calculating d a on the second layer, and based on that, this is. We, we, um, we can calculate also the set. This is the difference. And based on that, we will calculate the, for the second layer, our dW and dBs. And make then later our improvements. And then we are go back here. We uh, calculate our dA for this, uh, for this function. We, you can replace this sigmoid now with uh, another uh, activation function and uh, calculate the d sets based on that multiplied element wise with this product and now we have more or less everything so we know we know how to calculate our dAs, we know how to calculate now our dW in the second layer, our dB in the second layer, our uh, dW, uh, DW, there I have it, our dW in the first layer, and also our dB in the first layer. And these are the values which I need to, uh, to learn. Because now I can apply this. First, I calculate the vectorial uh, application implementation, and I uh, apply this to, for the learning algorithm. Yeah, this is uh, imp this is the implementation already written uh, how do we can write this in, uh, in, in, uh, in Python and uh, the update then the update then is that I say I'm learning this 
Yes? I always take, I always say EWL uh, is WL minus alpha DWL. And I'm done. Or uh, DBL, ah, sorry, 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 WL. Uh, uh, BL, this is the bias, is bias at layer L minus alpha DB on layer L. So we are coming now to the question of the initialization. Um, if you remember, we initialized, we initialized our, um, in the logistic regression, uh, sorry? One more question. How, how, how do we see from here that we are actually correcting our weights? And sorry? Because we, we measured uh, how, how, how much different we, we, we were from the result. Now, we are looking um, in, in um, let's say so. The back propagation gives us an insight how the output error is propagated to the different weights and biases. And we should improve, by this value, we should improve uh, this output. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the, these weights. Yeah. This is like an error propagation which you have if you are measuring something and then you see how this error, uh, error measuring is propagated in your calculations. Yeah, I just want to see where... No, no, this is, this is, uh, this one, this, this I will discuss now, I didn't discuss it. Mm. I only say, this is the way how I can improve it. Mm. Yes. I say the new value, the new weights mm -hmm. are the old weights minus learning rate like the differences. Oh, okay. And the new bias is the old bias at always a layer L. Uh, the only layer which we will not improve, where we do nothing, is the input layer, because the input you cannot improve. Yeah. The input is at the, as it is. So, now we are coming to the question uh, about the initialization. Of course, in the case of the logistic regression, I told you that uh, I can initialize with zeros. The question is, can we also initialize with zeros? And let's, let's a little bit uh, see what happens if I have my matrix with zeros and the bias with zeros. If, if the matrix is zeros, you remember this, I multiply it like with my initial, with my data, then plus zero, then I will get here zero. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter which kind of, uh, uh, which kind of activation function you, you are using, you are getting zeros. You are learning this. So this is a reason, this is a reason why it makes sense to use another way of initialization. And the easiest thing for the initialization is, if we are using random numbers. So for these weights and also for these weights, we initialize, we initialize with random numbers. And uh, sometimes also the, it depends if you want a random number, if you want a random number very small, then multiply it again with some factor. For example, 0 0.01. So the random number in any case, if this is a normal, is a normal distributed uh, random number, is between 0 and 1. Uh, nevertheless, it's quite big, and then you can make the, the, the weight much, much, uh, much smaller. <coughs> and uh, maybe, hopefully, you will learn better. The uh, bias, the bias, the initial bias could be zero. It's not necessary. You can also choose a random number, but uh, um, quite often we are using zero. Uh, this is not the only um, approach for the initialization. If you go to the literature, uh, one uh, initialization is uh, called the He initialization. It's already a Chinese influence. Of course, it's Chinese also. And uh, another initialization, uh, I forgot the name. It's a Spanish name. 
maybe I remember this on the Wednesday. But it means um, you can, uh, can have a look to the literature and find out different initialization number, uh, initialization methods, because a good initialization shortens you the computation time. Or let's say your computer, maybe not the computation time, but the computation effort. And if we know time is money, then you're also sparing money. <coughs> but in, uh, nobody, there is no, let's say, no algorithm which tells you for this application you should use this uh, initialization, for this application you should use this initialization. This is a question of, uh, of experience. So a good start in any case is this kind of initialization. But isn't it possible to create some kind of algorithm which can no, no. Of course, we have, you have so different, you have so many different uh, uh, different uh, problems where you apply machine learning. And uh, on one data, this uh, this initialization with this, I think you are learning faster. On the other data, with this initialization. But this can be done again using machine learning. Right? You have. <laughs> okay, you will have your topic for the for the master thesis. <laughs> Or, sorry, maybe for the PhD or for your habilitation. <laughs> uh, let's say so. I don't know such uh, such a kind, but oh, this should be discussed if this is really possible. If this is really possible because in that case, you also should be able to classify the classified the applications. Like, for example, now I'm working on an application and I want to trying to guess what kind of features and sales pipelines our mm. business is going to use based on them, their company profile. So if you are, it, it's also like the same configuring something. It's kind of similar. If we can somehow collect data in a correct way. Well, maybe you can do this in that case, you're checking the business cases. <coughs> and you say, if I apply this to this business case, then it makes sense. Uh, to work with that kind of applications or with that kind of algorithms, with that kind of, um, yeah, like a recommender system. This is possible. If you, if you work on a recommender system and you have, to have a breakthrough, then you will get the same money as the team working from Netflix. Yeah, this was one million dollar. Yeah. Not Netflix, this was um, Netflix um, announced the competition several years. The, the, the competition is over, uh, but they announced um, uh, a competition to build a recommender system for their applications, so that they have improvement of the benefit for ten percent in the And um, of course, one million dollar is not so less money, and a lot of uh, groups were working on that, um, but the, the winner was not implemented. This was the funny thing. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, it was to complete. It was good. The results were good, but the the effort for the implementation was too high, mm -hmm. and they decided to work with the second winner. So. So that you have a table, but uh, of course. We can create it. Right, one moment. I'll just. Uh, uh, but um, you should check the literature. It's the only thing what I can tell you. It is not so. Uh, I didn't see, at least in the literature, where you get the table and say these are the use cases. These are the activation functions which you use, should use in that case, and these are the initializations. 
But uh, one thing what I can tell you, if you're working with a sigmoid function over all the network, uh, you will not get really good results. The sigmoid function. The sigmoid functions. So in the hidden layers, it is recommended to work with this and also, this and also. So what we want to do, I will show you. Just we have a data set like that, and we want a classifier who is classifying the red and the uh, and the blue dots. And you see, uh, the, the distribution is not is not really good distribution. We will do this um, with two different kinds of algorithms. We want to I will uh, apply a logistic regression and then a simple network, and we will see if we have improvement or not. <coughs> the metrics which we are using is just the. Uh, So the shape of our uh, x is uh, 2 by 400. We have, so this means we have 400 dots. And of course, we have also 400 legs. So first of all, for the, uh, we will use uh, a simple logistic regression. In that case, I'm uh, a little bit lazy, and I'm using a library, Skilearn, and um, with the Skilearn library, uh, where we have a logistic regression. With cross Sorry? With cross validation. Yes. Yes, with cross validation. Okay, maybe to to explain for people who don't know what is cross validation. Uh, If you have your data, then you can normally, let's say, the first thing what I told you was to split the data in a, a training and a test set. But uh, the point, the problem in that case is the following. Um, if, you, if you make your training and you want to test it, and you want to test it, then you can use the test set only once. Then, of course, you can use the same data, but again, you have to reshuffle uh, in, a, in, a, in a random way your data, or you you are working with uh, with, with other methods to, to 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 pick the data out. But uh, the improvement uh, the improvement is always if you want to make an improvement, you always have to re reorganize your data. A better way in that case, if you work on your algorithm, is to split your algorithm in uh, a train set, a cross-validation set, and in a test set. So for example, this could be 60%, 20%, 20%, and it's up to you a little bit to move here. So what you're doing, you're training your algorithm and you're checking it with the cross-validation. You're not satisfied, you change, you change the hyperparameters of your algorithm. Train it again, check it again on the cross-validation. And you do it as often as you want, and last but least you are satisfied, and then you test it only once on the test set. Uh, the, what is the advantage? The advantage is that you are avoiding the bias problem. Yeah? Because every time, if we are using, if we are using our test set uh, a second time, when we improved already our algorithm, it is biased. Because we used already the results of the test set to improve the algorithm. I know that in practice this is used, it is done, but it is from a at least from a statistical point of view not really not really clean. So 
So, and for this, thank you for what you remarked. Uh, in that case, we are using the cross validation. May I ask a question? One moment. Yes? What is the simple parameters for simple logistic regression? Why we do uh, cross validation in this case? Uh, we don't have case, weights. In that case, I think 60 20 20. But this is automatically there. there. You, you just plug it in in the, li in the library. This is, this mm. is like working on TensorFlow. If you plug in uh, a comment on TensorFlow, you no, don't know what are the parameters behind. Okay. And it's the same with the library here. You should have a look to the, directly to the library, but I think uh, it is the, uh, this, this splitting what I showed you, 60, 20, 20. But okay, you also find 80, 10, 10. Mm -hmm. This is also possible. So um, the important thing is to show that with the logistic regression, we have not a really good result for the uh, uh, <coughs> for the uh, uh, classification. And you see, the accuracy is about uh, 47 percent, and 47 percent even for machine learning is very very bad. So now you can try to uh, use. A neural network, and here you have the input. We have only one hidden layer. We will use uh, four units in the hidden layer. The input we have only blue and and red uh, data, and as the uh, uh, activation function, we will use uh, here the tangent hyperbolicus function and then the output the output the output we will use a sigmoid function. So and the prediction the prediction is done based on this on on this. And the prediction uh, at E is if our output is greater than 0 0.5 then we will put it one and now we should decide is one red or blue and otherwise zero. So the cost function, uh, the cost function for this uh, is the same as you know already. So the first thing what we should implement is the layer size. And uh, the layer size is um, Taken, taken from our matrix X. Yes. Uh, also for Y, for Y, you remember this was the first, the first, uh, the, the, the number of rows is uh, the number of um, the number of uh, datas which we have in our data set. So and uh, then also and Y is the number of uh, labels which we have in our data uh, label, and we return this. Um, these numbers. Well, how, how actually do we decide how many layers we need? In that case, we are speaking about the sw uh, swallow network only one. Mm -hmm. About uh, let's say um, deeper deeper networks. I will speak on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some special things to have in mind. B what about nodes? How many nodes? Two. In that case, we uh, we choose only four. There is no rule which how many nodes. Uh, I would say use use uh, use um, a simple modeling rule. Kiss. Keep it stupid and simple. In in that case, I'm using four nodes. But um, what what you will see later, we will uh, we will change the number of nodes and see if we are getting better results. Uh, the point is the following, not always if you are increasing, 
if you are, or let's say, so let it say in, in other words, if you are expecting that the increasement of the number of nodes increases your accuracy, this is not true. There will be some saturation, and then maybe even the accuracy is going down. So, you, you check it, you check, because adding nodes is not such a problem. Um, and uh, you can check it by, let's say, four nodes, five nodes, ten like nodes, fifty nodes. Like cross validation, you can uh, yeah. define say yeah, but in that case, in that case, we, we it's really it's an other <coughs> algorithm, <coughs> and we have not the problem which <coughs> which we have in this case. So again, <coughs> you see, um, we have the size of the input layer is uh, five, the size of the hidden layer is four and the size of the output layer is 2. And this was also what, what was expected. So about the uh, model par parameters, so we want to have in the model parameters, we want to initialize, we want to initialize here the parameters for uh, our weights and also for our bias in the first and in the second layer. And you see I multiply this with a small factor. You can also use uh, even smaller factor. You can also skip this factor, uh, but then the, uh, the initialization, the numbers are quite high. Because the random numbers between uh, zero and one have on mostly only one uh, one position of let's say the, the, the MSB is, is one in that mm. case. And we want to have uh, an MSB zero. Um, so and then again we are also taking uh, the shapes and we are building something like a library. So in the library we have uh, different words. And these words have values. And we, first of all, we are using the initialized values, and later we will uh, renew the values uh, after a recalculation. So just only so that we see, these are random numbers. They have at least the second only the second position after after zero is uh, different from zero. Of course, we have also negative ones, and the bias, the initial bias, is zero. So now we are doing the forward propagation. And as you can see, the forward propagation is just using uh, the mass which we discussed on the slides. This is nothing special. Uh, the only maybe uh, important thing is that we are using the dot function, uh, the dot operation, and then the tension uh, hyperbolicus operation from the NumPy, um, from the NumPy uh, library. But this is just because uh, we wanted to uh, to work with matrices. And uh, this is just a test case. Uh, we are forwarding uh, these, uh, we, we are for, we are checking the forward propagation test case and then uh, see what is the output. And for the output, we are just printing the means. If the means are more or less in the same region, then you can be sure that your algorithm is working uh, properly. So the next is the cost computing. I should implement the cost function, but again, the cost function is following, the cost function is following um, the, uh, the way how we de de define the cost function. 
just only applying just only applying uh, numby operations but this is just only because uh, this is a, a matrix uh, this is a matrix and if you would apply normal operations you would get an error as an output So, we are coming to the um, challenging part. The challenging part is the backward propagation. This is in every, in, uh, every uh, let's say, implementation, the backward propagation is um, the part where you spend most of the time. So, what we are doing, you remember, for the backward propagation, we needed our parameters. We needed cash, and then we should calculate. We should calculate our increments for C2, W2, B2, C1, W1, and B1. And to calculate this, we are just following the formulas which we which we use. You remember for the the input arrow was this difference. This we multiplied, if we are multiplied as matrices, this, uh, this, um, this part with the output from the layer A1 transposed. And so on and so on. It's just following the formulas. And here we have, uh, we are putting this in the library grads and have a return of grads. So we have now a library. Uh, if the input, if you put in the input of your function here, we have the parameters and we have cache, and from the cache we are taking always the new values. And the new values, they are updated, they are updated in the cache. Let's make a test. So it's more or less, yes. more or less fine. Now we can uh, try to work. No, it's not. We are not finished. So now it comes to the question of the uh, uh, to the question of the uh, um, step size. Uh, this is just um, a demonstration. A demonstration. If you take, if you take the the step, this is a small step, and you see with the gradient descent we are reaching the minimum. Mm. In that case, the step is too big, and this is just only jumping. You never reach the minimum, mm. and that's the point. So, uh, but it's more time. So we have yeah, okay, but even if you would have a longer time, it would not reach you can because you can show it. Because the search, uh, the search, uh, this can be shown by mass. Uh, the search direction is always um, perpendicular to uh, the gradient. Uh, this is always perpendicular. And if this is too big, because this is going up here again, you are jumping just in this direction. So, this is just a function for updating the parameters. I will not show this in detail because I want to come to an end. Is this in Coursera? Uh, yes, this, this, is, but this, is my, this is my example in Coursera. Um, I can give you uh, I can give you this example later. This uh, is also in, in the in the in the uh, in the files which I gave you. You find it also in GitHub. So, and now we have the model. We are taking the parameters. We initialize the parameters. And then we run this in a loop. We have the forward propagation, we have the costs, we have the backward propagations, we have the updated parameters, and 
it is just up to us to define uh, how, how often we will go through this loop uh, to make the training. So now we are coming to the predictions. As you see, it looks a little bit better. Of course, we have still arrows, mm -hmm. but uh, of course, in that region we have red points, and in that region we have blue points. Nevertheless, most of the points here in that region, that region, are blue, and in that region and that region they are red. So this kind of classification is even better now. Uh, <coughs> but I guess it will get better if you repeat it many times. Yeah, we uh, the iteration the iteration was uh, ten thousand. Mm. So I'm intending to buy more. Yeah, of course you can improve, but it's the question if you have time. I can, of course I can I can change this. Let's say fifteen thousand time. Just to see how much. It's in. I was sorry, this was... There is no... Hmm? I guess there will not be any improvement. There will be not. Of course, it is already saturated. Right? Oh. The wish of my clients is what I want. <coughs> not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. Of course, you see, uh, this is a problem was not what not really can be improved. At least if I use such kind of, uh, of boundaries. If the boundaries would be nonlinear, if I would use nonlinear boundaries, then of course it could be improved. So, and... Uh, and what would be the problem again not linear functions here? Well, no, no, this has nothing. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm speaking about the discrimination, the discrimination functions. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the discrimination is done by, by a linear function. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it is possible to use also nonlinear discrimination functions. And in that case, uh, maybe we can have it. <coughs> but this has nothing to do with the, with the, with the uh, um, activation function. Yeah, the accuracy is about 90%. Which is good. Yeah. It depends. It depends. If the red points would be cancer and the blue point non-cancer, I would say not. It depends from the application. Sensitivity. Yeah. But the sensitivity in that case will be not very high. <laughs> yeah. In my case, 80% is also fine. Yeah, I say, it, it, it depends from the application. But in any case, we have a big improvement against the accuracy which we decided in the beginning with the logistic regression. And uh, if you remember, I defined, I defined uh, uh, machine learning, solving a concrete task, defining a performance measure, and uh, run this with, this with some concrete algorithm. So, let me run this for you. It takes a little bit more time. And this is a question of... Ah, he left for it. <laughs> oh, who asked me this? Can we still see the fault that each weight is actually breathing into the whole? No, this is... No. That is... Yeah, of course, you can, we can see that we have to put it in change. We have to stop the algorithm to see what is in, in, in the what is in the library. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, what I'm doing is the following. I'm writing the new weights in, in, my, in my library, 
and update the library and forget the old values. And then I update again, forget the old values. So this means I had to stop at, at the step, I don't know, uh, 100 and then uh, take this, the next step. So, and somebody asked me what means adding units in the layer. And this is for one hidden unit, two hidden units, three hidden units, four hidden units, five hidden units. And now we see if I even have 20 or 50 hidden units, the accuracy is not improving. But the calculation time and the calculation effort is, of course, increasing. So this means not always uh, increasing the number of units in the layer brings you better results. But of course I would have better results if I would uh, put the second layer. Yes. Uh, but uh, I had to I, you know, I had to make I had to make another assumptions that the the the, 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 um, the discrimination uh, curves are not linear because here I have linear discrimination curves. If I use uh, non-linear discrimination curves, it will be better. But with linear discrimination curves, I am not sure that I will. Can we have linear in one um, layer and then non-linear in? No, 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 the discrimination curves are on the output. Ah. May I ask a question? Yeah? Uh, for, the, uh, for the hidden layers, yes? uh, the, the nodes of uh, seven hidden layers should be equal or no. different? No, no, no. You will see this especially um, if you go for convolutional layers. Okay. They are special playing. They are they are, they are playing on the on the dimensions of the hidden layers. Yeah. And of course not. Okay. Otherwise, it depends on the, on your data, right? No, it depends not only on the data. It depends really from the architecture what you want to do. Uh, maybe on uh, if if you give me a little bit more time on Wednesday. So okay. for people who are really interested, I can show I can show uh, a little bit different architectures, and then you will see that the the layers are very very. For example, if you take Alexa uh, Alexa architecture and compare this with a Google Net architecture, or in normally called Inception architecture, then you will see. The Alexa architecture has five layers. The Inception architecture has around 21 and more. It's much deeper. And of course, uh, the dimension of the layers is, is uh, then taken based on the function what you are expecting the layer should do. Because if you play on the dimensions on the layers, because you are using in the layers different kind of filters, this is the idea of a convolutional network. Yeah. It's the reason why it's called convolution. Yeah, it's a, the application of a convolution um, uh, of a convolution operation, and uh, this means there is there is let's say so um, really an idea behind what which kind of dimensions I'm using. In that case, we are just testing, adding, adding, adding. Say, okay, fine, four is fine. But uh, there is no special, no special, let's say, calculation in advance to say, okay, four units, this is the best one. Mm. It's just to try. Rule of thumb. <coughs> yeah, you see. This is for 50 layer. This is for 50 layers. And, ah, sorry, this is for 50 layers. This is for 20 layers. And here already the, the functions are a little bit uh, non-linear. Nevertheless, it is not taking this one. Here, if the, if this function would go this way. We would be much more precise. Maybe. I didn't test. And also here, uh, the, if, this will, if this will at least take away 
or classify these two points and that point uh, as a red one, then of course we have an improvement of the accuracy. Um, there are other data sets and you can play with this data set. So I give you this, this file and then you can take the, the data sets are in the, uh, in the um, in, in uh, let's say in, in, the, in the zip file and then you can check it with your with this kind of data or you load your own data you can have also your own scatter plot and based on that because the uh, the program is uh, is managed in such a way that the dimension of the input data uh, doesn't uh, doesn't play any role you can use any dimension uh, only the dimension of the label set and of the uh, of the input, uh, let's say the x values should be there. Yeah, the number should be the same. You should have as much numbers as you have data sets. Can we use uh, neural networks for regression problems, uh, not only for classification? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can we use a neural network for regression problems where y dependent is numerical? not uh, classification problem. You mean for prediction? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in that case, the active action uh, function is a simple uh, linear regression? Mm, yes, it will be a linear regression. It will be mm. a linear regression. That's, no. But, but it, of course, this is possible to, to use um, neural networks for, for prediction. Mm. And it, it, is, it is done. I, I'm, I'm used, I, I showed this here uh, only in that case because um, for, for the prediction you have no backward, pro, no real backward propagation and I wanted to show also the, back, the backward propagation because uh, a linear regression, for a linear regression the uh, gradient descent is much easier and the derivatives are much easier and the backward propagation is much easier so all this Let's say the, the 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 things which make make the pepper uh, or the salt of of these problems stay out. <laughs> but uh, coming back to your question, yes, this is possible, and it is used. So uh, this means I'm done for today. And uh, who is interested? I I heard on Wednesday at ten o'clock. That's true. Yes. So my plan for Wednesday um, at 10 o'clock is... Yeah, you had a question? Uh, is there a usage for um, complex numbers? Let's say so. I cannot say yes or not. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, for what you would like to use complex numbers? That's the after. Okay. I, uh, I, I never saw it. This is the only answer which I can uh, give you, but I think it's quite easy to go to Archive X and to put these two uh, search terms in Archive X, uh, deep, uh, let's say, uh, neural networks, complex numbers, and you will get if there are papers or not. So my plans for, the, for, for Wednesday I wanted to tell you. On Wednesday I wanted to show you uh, what is if you are adding uh, additional layers. Um, uh, but I will do it mostly for, um, let's say, full connected um, neural networks. And a little bit, but just only a little bit, uh, show what changes if we are going to convolutional networks. But nevertheless, I will show you examples. So running examples where you can later uh, the the the, um, the materials are are on the server. But I gave you the input to the server, so you can download the input. And, uh, uh, if you have an Anaconda uh, environment running, which has installed all the necessary things, this is you, you know. First of all, I I found out. Um, I was I was doing these files with uh, Python 3.5 and 3.6. Anaconda is now using 3.7, and 
already uh, not everything is working. Until now, I couldn't find out why. Oh. And so this is always a version question, and I cannot assure you that it will run on Wednesday. So the so-called doesn't work on the other conduct that we try to um, let's say, so um, these files, these files should work, but uh, the other files where, where I'm using then tf-learn, I try to install, uh, I try to install TensorFlow, and I'm go going, getting always uh, multiple error. And now I have should, uh, should go and, and sit down and find out uh, why I have this multiple error. But it's a version problem. It's a version problem, and also uh, in some in some cases uh, they are running already, working already already with TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, when I'm using here TensorFlow, this was 1.2, 1.3. These are elder files, and I have nobody who is doing for me the work to update them. Uh, the maintenance of files is. Always a big problem. Yes. I, but I think you know this, but it's. Uh, okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.